Hello and welcome. My name is Crystal Dobson. I'm glad you've joined us to, for today's webinar, Drill Hole Exploration Workflows in Target and Target for ArcGIS. Just a few housekeeping details. We'll be having a 45-minute presentation and taking questions at the end. We want to encourage you to ask questions. At any time, enter your questions into the questions window of the GoToWebinar interface and we will answer questions at the end of the presentation. If your audio drops, you can call in via telephone by selecting telephone on your GoToWebinar interface, then using the numbers provided. If you encounter other difficulties and your connection drops, we will send you the link to the recording. Today we will be looking at working with drill hole data from planning to 3D visualization and the generation of geological models. Before we start our presentation, I have a quick poll question to pose to everyone. After today's seminar, I am hoping to A, apply the information to a current or upcoming project, or B, learn more about Geosoft workflows to process drill hole data. Thank you for responding to the poll. Let's turn to our presentation. Today, Lee will be using Geosoft Target and Target for ArcGIS tools and demonstrating our drill hole exploration workflows at different stages of development. I would like to introduce our presenter, Lee Stephen. Lee is a technical analyst based here in Perth focusing on technical support and applications training. I will now hand it over to Lee. Thank you, Crystal. And hi everyone, um, my name is Lee Stephen and welcome to this webinar called Drill Hole Exploration Workflows, Target and Target for ArcGIS. As Crystal mentioned, I'm a technical analyst at GSoft, so I provide training for a variety of our software packages, including Oasis Montage, Target and Target for ArcGIS, and also provide technical support for our customers. So what we're focusing on today is Target. And to give you a, an idea of what to expect in this webinar, are we starting off with an overview of what Target can do? But the bulk of the presentation will be in the live demonstration portion where I'll show you our Target surface mapping tools, drill hole tools, and our 3D capabilities. I'll also show you our workflow for digitizing your interpretations on 2D maps, such as sections and wireframing them, wireframing them together into 3D bodies. At the end, I'll give a brief overview of Target for ArcGIS and show you what that looks like within that environment. So just a brief introduction to what Target is. Target is used to manage, analyze, and visualize large volumes of data. This can be surface data or drill hole data. So for example, you can use this to visualize surface geochemistry soil samples, geophysical surveys, as well as visualize drill hole or borehole subsurface data. We have set up the software menus to be easy to use with an easy to follow workflow, which I'll be showing you shortly. We are industry partners with ESRI, so I'll be demonstrating our ESRI integration capabilities as well. So without further ado, we'll jump into the live demonstration. Okay, so you should all be able to see my screen now where I have Target running. Um, now Target can exist on its own as a standalone piece of software, or it can function as an extension within Oasis Montage. Um, as I mentioned before, we also have an extension called Target for ArcGIS, which works within the ArcGIS platform. Um, so what we're looking at right now is Target as you would see it as a standalone product or within Oasis Montage. They both look identical. So with Target, um, the three main menus that you have is surface mapping, DH data, and DH plot. And what I have here is a surface map that I've created, and I've got an aerial satellite image which I've pulled down using our Bing Maps tool. And the rest of the menus that you see up here, um, these are additional processing and mapping menus that you can use in addition to the target menus. As I mentioned before, we are industry partners with Esri. So when you install um, Target or Oasis Montage, you also install along with it the Arc Engine. So what that means is you can use the ArcGIS menu to open an existing MXD uh, which is the native file format for a map in ArcGIS. You can also save the current map to an MXD file as well. So I have open here an MXD file in Target, and what I can do is grab one of the layers in it and drag and drop it into my surface map. 
So what I've done here is I've imported um, some magnetic contours onto my regional map. So the cross functionality between these two platform, platforms is, is really great. Continuing on with the surface mapping menu, the surface mapping menu is organized in a top-down workflow. So generally you can start at the top and work your way down the menu. So I first thing I did was I imported some data. Now this can be from a variety of formats, whether it's geochemistry surface soil samples or geophysics. Um, I then set the coordinate system for that data. I can create a new map from that database, um, as you can see with the map I have open now. You can add base map elements such as the north arrow, the scale bar, and the title block that you can see. And then you can do a whole lot of symbolizing of that data using these options over here. You can also import from a variety of GIS um, sources and formats as well. So what I'm going to show you here is a snapshot of an area where I have imported some geochemistry soil samples. So here I've displayed the symbols for the geochemistry and I have colored and sized them proportionally based on the concentration of gold values. And this is done from the surface mapping menu and then symbols. What you can then do with point data, whether it's elevation data, geophysics data or geochemistry data, is we can then create a raster from those points. So that's um, a grid. And here's an example of a grid that I've created from my geochemistry. So the grid is basically interpolating in between the observed data points that we have. Um, with the grid, we, can, we have many options to control the output of this grid and we can also change the color scheme to represent different data ranges. With the grid, we can also contour it. So with the contours, um, you can control the contour intervals, um, you can control the labeling and the colors of the contours. So all of this is done through the surface mapping menu, gridding, and also contouring. So that's it for the surface mapping menu. I'll now show you DH data, which is drill hole data, and DH plot. And these are the two menus that are used for handling drill hole data. So the first thing you would do is you start at the top and you create a new drill hole project. You then proceed to import your drill hole data. Now you can import from a variety of sources such as text files, CSV files, Excel spreadsheets, Microsoft Access databases, and pretty much any database that you can create an ODBC link for, you can bring it into Target. We also have an acquire drill hole import wizard as well, which you can use, and you can import last file data. So here's an example. Um, in my Project Explorer, you can see down here all the uh, drill hole data that I've loaded into this project. So I'll give you an example um, of my assay database, which has my geochemistry samples in it. Now what I'm looking at here is the data for one drill hole, AXRC004. And what I can do with this data is I can view it in a graphical profile um, down the bottom here. And if I wanted to, I could superimpose um, other data channels in this profile window as well to compare them. What I can then do is use the page up and page down buttons and scroll through the rest of the drill holes and I can get an idea of the distribution um, across the drill holes. What I can also do is grab statistics for a selection of values in my database. So I can select those values, right click, and look at the statistics for those. So these are just basic statistics. What I can also do is select all the values across all of the drill holes and grab statistics um, for that as well. I'll show you an example of my geology database, so my lithology and my rock codes. Again, this is set up in a similar fashion. I'm looking at the data for one drill hole, and we have from two intervals. So from this depth to this depth, I have this rock type. And using this rock code channel, we can build what we call a rock code file. A rock code file basically maps the rock codes to a pattern and a color and also a description. So when I click this, populate from channel button, 
that will just import all the rock codes from my rock channel and then I can start um, selecting a pattern and color for them. This rock code information is saved in a CSV file which is shareable. So that means only one person at your company would need to do this. And then once they have, they can share that with your colleagues and you can use those across all of your maps um, for your company. That way the colors and patterns will be standardized. Okay, so once you've imported your data, you can set the coordinate system for your drill hole project. And then you might want to run some quick QAQC um, on your drill hole data. So I'll show you that tool. So what QAQC will do is it'll search for common errors that occur when logging drill hole data. So here are some errors that it will scan for, um, for my FROM2 data. So that's my assays and my geology databases. It will search for errors such as missing intervals, overlapping intervals, where the FROM and TO are greater than the whole bottom, duplicated sample numbers, etc. And for my collar database, there's a different set of errors which it will search for. And likewise with my survey database, there's a different bunch of errors that it will search for as well. What I can also do is run QAQC on all the data in my drill hole project. And what that will do is it will give me a report, a text file report of those errors. So you can see in my assay database, I have a lot of missing intervals. So that means there's a lot of um, space um, in the drill holes. In my geology database, I have a lot of from, missing from two intervals as well and some overlapping intervals. So what we'd recommend you now do is give the support to your database manager where they would make the appropriate updates in the source database. So whether you make updates to your source database um, based on the QAQC, QAQC report or whether you've just imported new data um, that you've got from the field, you can make those changes in the source data and then come back into target and click refresh project. And essentially with one click you will re-import all your drill hole data with the most up-to-date um, data. And that's done so using a template which is saved during the import wizard the first time that you import your data. Another useful tool which you can use on your databases is the composite database option. Now this allows you to recalculate your from two intervals and give you an average value based on um, an interval uh, selection method that you choose. So for example you can do fixed intervals so you can average every 10 meters for example. You can do a lithological interval so you can average based on the rock unit and another one is significant intersections. Now with significant intersections, you would select your primary assay channel that you want to look at and then you'd set your significant intersection options, so your minimum composite length and your minimum composite grade. And that will spit out a database and report to you those intersections, which you could then display on a section. Now that you've imported all your data, you can start to visualize your drill hole data using the dhplot. So the first thing I might do is create a quick, simple 3D map just to dis display my drill holes with some other data. So what I did was display my drill hole traces with some topography. I've got a satellite image and I've also imported an uh, existing geological model. So now I can be confident that my drill holes are positioned in the correct place. So with that in mind, I can now proceed to create a plan map. So creating maps in GSoft, you get a dhplot uh, plan map. And all our um, maps are created in a tabbed dialog box fashion. So it's an iterative process. We would come in here, make modifications to the tabs, have a look at the result, come back into this dialog, make more modifications and update the existing map. So I'll give you an example of a plan map that I've created earlier. So in this plan map, I have colored my collar locations based on the whole depth. You can see that here in the legend. Along the drill hole traces, I have displayed 
rock patterns for one particular rock type, which in this case is the iron formation, which is what I'm interested in. And this will give me an idea of the strike of the mineralization zone. But you can plot um, lots of different um, data down your drill hole as well. So you can plot um, bar plots down your hole trace. You can post um, the data values themselves. You could do a line profile down your hole trace, and you can also create plan grids. But I'll get into that later when we talk about um, sections. In the background, I also have a magnetic grid, but that could also be any um, georeferenced image as well. Before I create a section, I'll show you our strip log tool. So our strip logs, um, you have lots of control over the strip log, and a strip log is basically a report of one drill hole, and we're just looking at all the data for that one drill hole. So here I've got my rock patterns, I've got my gold bar plots, the gold values, and a line profile of arsenic. With the strip logs, they're fully customizable, so you can control the strip positioning, where they're plotted. Um, you can actually plot up to 32 different um, data types in your strip log, so they can get really complicated if you want them to be. With a page layout, you can create a strip log for one drill hole, a range of drill holes, or you can do it for all your drill holes. So batching strip logs is really easy. Here's another, stri here's another strip log that I've created. Um, so if you have structured data, so if you have the dip and dip direction for a particular structure type, you can create fracture density plots, stereo nets, and also tadpole um, plots. Okay, so this will give you an idea of the orientation um, of your structure along the drill hole traces. I'll show you an example of some fence diagrams, which you can also create. So fence diagrams are particularly useful when you have limited holes or, you, or your drill holes are in a non-parallel line. So for example, you can see on the right-hand side here, my drill holes are not in a parallel line. If I were to create a section for this, I would need to create a section width um, that would be wider than optimal. Um, that can, you can run into problems with um, interpreting a section that's that wide. So with a fence diagram over here, I have a two-dimensional section view of 3D data. So I can compare my downhole geology using these geology polygons, which connect rocks of the same type from drill hole trace to drill hole trace. Um, and it will do it along this fence line like this. This fence diagram is 3D georeference, so you can um, display this in the 3D viewer as well. So now let's talk about creating sections in Geosoft. So I've got a DH plot section, and I have these tabs again. So I've got a tab where I can um, define the section location, and I've got a data tab where I can choose what data I want to plot down the drill hole trace. So defining a section location is really easy. We can actually define the section simply by drawing a box on a plan map. So if I hit this define button, it will bring up my plan map. And I can draw a rectangle around my drill holes, center them, and that will be my drill hole um, location, my section location. I can also update the location and the dimensions uh, inter, uh, manually up here. With a number of sections, we can batch a whole bunch of sections. So I can choose to create 13 sections at once. And when I hit the define button, I can define the section location for 13 sections at once. Now that I've got my section location, I can head to the data tab. And you can see for the data, we have lots of options for plotting data down the drill hole trace. We can use bar plots. We can create section grids across the drill hole traces. We can post the values of the data. We can post numeric bands down the hole trace, line profiles, and structural text if you have structural data. So I'll show you an example um, of a section that I've created. So here's a simple section map that I've created. And you can see in the section view here, I've gridded the gold values across my drill hole traces. Just zoom in. 
I've posted the rock patterns down the whole trace on the right hand side. I've also plotted, plotted the gold values as a bar plot. In the top here I've got a plan view of my section location which is marked out in red. And this section is 3D georeferenced, so any interpretations which I draw using our CAD tools are also 3D georeferenced and can be viewed in the 3D viewer. One thing to note is that once you've created your section, you can save all the map plotting parameters to a template file. So that's your map plotting parameters and your data plotting parameters. So that when you create more sections in the future or sections for a different project area, you can make use of that template. So you don't have to spend time setting up that section again. So that's it for sections. I'll now show you our 3D tools. So here's our 3D viewer and in it you can display a whole bunch of different information in your 3D viewer. So right now I'm displaying the drill holes and if I go add to 3D drill holes, this is how I'm displaying the drill hole traces and the data down those drill hole traces. And I've loaded in some topography which gets clipped to the drill hole extents. So let's take a closer look at that data. You can see the rock patterns and we'll focus in now on my gold values which you should be able to see as bar plots and I'll just rotate this. So I have all, all my gold values down the trace and what I can do with that is I can create a 3D grid which is a voxel. So here's an example of a 3D grid. Now this voxel is just interpolating in between um, those downhole gold values to create a block model. So each data value is represented by a cube. And this is created by going to add to 3D, sorry, voxel, 3D gridding, and then creaking. And you'd select the channel to grid. And with the more button, you have more advanced options for controlling the output. So you can control the interpretation distance. You can do the gridding in log space if you want to, if you have logarithmically distributed data. Um, you have options to control anisotropic gridding, so you can force the gridding in a particular strike and dip direction. With the variogram tab, um, you can select parameters to create a statistical model which matches the observed data. So you can select the model type and input a range, sill and nugget values for that variogram. So with the voxel, we can view it in a different in a variety of ways. We can change the transparency. We can clip the voxel to an area of interest. We can also clip the voxel by data range. So we can clip away all the low values and leave just the high values that we're interested in. From the voxel, we can also create isosurfaces. And so here's an example of an isosurface. So isosurfaces are 3D contours. They look like smooth shells, and on the surface of those shells represents one data value. So the largest shell here is the data value 1.3 ppm, and within that you can see a smaller shell, which is the value for 1.8 and inside that is 2.47 and so on. As well as numerical voxels, we can also create lithology voxels. Um, so these voxels are based on strings or text in your drill hole project. So for example, I've created a lithology voxel based on my rock codes. So I've just interpolated all the rock codes in my project to create this block model. And what I can do with this um, lithology voxel is turn on and off different rock types that I'm interested in. So I can select none and then just turn on the rock unit for the iron formation that I'm interested in and have a look at this model. So creating numerical voxels and lithology voxels are considered uh, implicit ge geological modeling. 
instead of creating an isosurface from this lithology voxel, what I could do is create a contact surface, a geology contact surface. So I can create a contact surface for the top of this layer or the base of this rock unit as well. So here's what that would look like. So this is considered a subsurface topography, which is the top of the um, iron formation layer. And I could also do one for the bottom of the layer. And you can choose which occurrence of that rock type you want to create the contact surface for. So whether it's the first occurrence of that rock in the model, or if it's the last, layer, uh, last occurrence of that rock in the model, you can choose which one. So that's, that's it for the 3D viewer. Um, you can also import a variety of different GIS formats in, and display them in your 3D viewer with all your information as well. So that's it for the target uh, drill hole and surface mapping menus. I'll now sh jump into our digitizing and wireframing workflow. So with target, we have a workflow for digitizing um, 2D interpretations onto maps, such as these sections that you can see here. And then you can advance those interpretations into the 3D viewer and start to build wireframe models um, to create open surfaces and also closed surfaces. So what I'll take you through now is the digitizing workflow. So the GeoStrings toolbar over here is what's going to drive this process. And so it makes it easy to access all the tools you need to start digitizing. So the first thing we're going to do is create a new geostring, and then we will proceed to add geological features to digitize. So I'll add in the overburden rock unit and select a color. And uh, the coordinate system is derived from the current database which in this case is one of my drill hole databases, and then I can add another geological feature to digitize. So I'll add my iron formation. And select a color. And I'll add one more feature, and this will be a fault line. And I'll select a polyline for the digitization type, and select a color. So you can see that the geostring stores multiple geological features. So this single file storage is really great for keeping your, your interpretations up to date and also for sharing with colleagues as well. So I'm going to start digitizing on one of my sections that I have here. And what I do is I start digitizing, select the active feature, and then we can choose some snapping options. So we can snap to true drill hole locations in the map. We can also snap to projected map groups, so your topography profile, uh, my geology rock patterns, etc. So what I'm going to do is snap to my topography layer. So right now, I'm snapping a point uh, to the center point of this section window along this topography profile. And what I'll do now is I'll change the snapping to my geology rock patterns. So this, op this snapping option is useful when your drill hole traces lie close to the center plane of the section window. I can choose a different feature to digitize. And now I will snap to the true drill hole location for my geology rock codes. So right now I am snapping to the true XYZ location for the interval or point in the selected database. And if I hover my mouse above that point, you will get some information on the true XYZ location of that point, as well as the distance off the section plane. So this tool is really great if you need detailed accuracy.
you can edit your, your interpretations at any point by selecting it and then editing the vertices. And the vertices can also be snapped to true true hole locations as well. Now if someone, a colleague of yours, sends you a geostring file that they've already created, you can open that. So I'm going to open an existing geostring file and you can view all the interpretations that they've drawn. Um, you can also view their geostring table which shows you the number of sections that they have, the location of that section and it also tells you how many interpretations that they've drawn for each feature on each map, which is really handy. So that's the digitizing workflow. I'll now take you into the wireframing workflow. So I'm in my 3D viewer now and I can display my geostring uh, with other data in the 3D viewer. So here's my geostrings. And because the geostring contains all the features that I've digitized and all the drawings on each section, we can see each individual feature over here on the left and each interpretation on the section maps. So to start digitizing, we need to be in wireframing mode and we select the active feature we want to wireframe and it will highlight in the map the shapes that are available to be wireframed together. So I'll just turn off some of these other rock types. So it's highlighted all the shapes that I can wireframe for the iron formation. So to start wireframing, I click on the first shape and proceed to click on the next shape to build the wireframe model. Now you can create separate bodies for the same geological feature using the add new wireframe body. So if you have a rock unit that occurs in two distinct locations that are separate, you can do so. You can also use this option to create a wireframe with bifurcations. So here's an example. If you're unhappy with any of the steps you've done, you can quickly undo and redo any of the previous steps. You can also select a portion of the wireframe and delete it. You can also discard all the steps you've done and start over again. Once you're happy with the wireframe, um, you can add end caps to the wireframe. So the options for end caps are flat, conical, and rounded. So just adding some end caps. And I'm going to stop wireframing. All the wireframing progress that I've done so far is stored in the geostring file. Um, so that way you can work on your wireframing session later or you can um, share your geostring with your colleagues so that they can look at your interpretations. So I'll continue wireframing. Once you have completed your wireframing, you can save the wireframe to a separate geosurface file. And this geosurface file can contain wireframes for all of your geological features. So again, that single file storage is handy to collaborate with your colleagues. So here's my finished geosurface of my wireframe model. Now you can see with polyline features, it will create an open surface and what we can do is get an estimate um, for the total surface area over here and with polygon features such as the eye formation we can get an estimate of the total volume.
Okay, so that brings me to the end of my digitizing and wireframing workflow. Um, the last thing I'm going to show you is Tiger for ArcGIS. I'll just give you an overview and I'll give you a quick um, preview of what that actually looks like in the ArcGIS environment. So Tiger for ArcGIS, it's an extension that runs within Esri's ArcGIS software. It's the same target and surface drill hole um, tools, but they're available to you within ArcGIS. So it's the same workflows and the same um, easy to use flow um, that you can do. And the benefit of working in ArcGIS is that you can output your plan maps, your section maps, your strip logs. You can output them as GSoft map layers, like you can see in this picture over here, using our GSoft template. So it's really quick to generate these GSoft map layers. Or you can also generate these, your data plots, as a series of shape files, so points, lines, polygons, and if you prefer to use Esri's um, symbology tools, you can use um, those capabilities to symbolize your map. So the, it's really flexible as to what you want to do. So I've talked about the shapefile outputs. Um, the workflow is the same as Target, so it's quick and easy to follow. The added benefit of Tiger for ArcGIS is that if your workflow is very GIS-centric and you have ArcGIS, you have the power to work within one environment, so you don't have to leave your GIS to actually do your drill hole um, exploration. As well as that, you have access to GSoft's 3D Viewer. So when you install Tiger for ArcGIS, you get the 3D Viewer that comes along with it, the same one that you saw before. So you don't actually have to have a ArcGIS 3D analyst license or spatial analyst to use that 3D viewer. So I'll just show you what Target for ArcGIS looks like. So I'm in, I've got my MXD open and Target for ArcGIS gives you these five toolbars over here. So one of the toolbars is used for setting up your license. That's this one over here. I'll just close that one. We've got another toolbar over here that's used for viewing your GSoft databases and managing your GSoft databases, which is this toolbar over here. We've got another toolbar that drives the wireframing process within Target for ArcGIS. So those wireframing capabilities that I showed you before, they are available within Target for ArcGIS as well. And that leaves me with target surface and target drill hole. So you can see that you have that same functionality that you have in target within the ArcGIS platform. So with target surface, we can import grids. We can create grids using minimum curvature, Kriging, inverse distance weighted. Um, we can also create contours from those grids. So that's all available on the target surface menu. That leaves me with target drill hole menu. So again, the same um, workflow. We start with the left and we move to the right. So we create a new project, import some data, set the coordinate system, do QAQC, and then we can proceed to create our drill hole maps. So plans, sections, fence diagrams, strip logs, and 3D drill hole plots. So the target capabilities are all here in ArcGIS as well. So in the background, I've got an example of a surface map. So I've got a GSoft grid in the background, which is my magnetics. Uh, I've displayed my geochemistry symbols, which you can see, and I've got magnetic contours as well. So I'll show you an example of the same plan map that I've created as before. Uh, what I want to point out is that you can also output my data or your data as a series of shape files. So I can also have the, the whole traces as line shape files, the collars as points, and I can use the Esri properties and the symbology tab, and I can customize the look of my data using the Esri tools. So there's that flexibility that I was talking about before. The same can be done with uh, strip logs. 
So here's an example of the same strip log that I've created. Here's my fence diagram. And I'll show you lastly, or second to last, a section that I've created. So this is the same section that I created in Target Standalone. And the last but not least is the 3D viewer, which you also have when you install um, Target for ArcGIS. So this is the same, exact same 3D viewer that you have in Target Standalone. So I can create those voxels, lithology voxels, ISO surfaces. So that's a preview of what Target looks like within ArcGIS. And with that, that brings me to the end of my presentation. And so I'll hand over to Crystal, but thanks everyone for joining, and I hope that was helpful. And uh, Crystal, over to you. Thank you, Lee. We are now going to take several questions. So while you're sending us your final questions, I wanted to remind everyone of a few things. Firstly, that the capabilities and workflows Lee showed us today are available in our most current releases, Target 8.204 and Target for ArcGIS 4.2. The first question is around, um, Lee, you mentioned the importing of Acquire. How would you import a Datashed database? Um, with the Datashed database, um, you could create an ODBC uh, link to that database. And then within Target, I'll just show you. In Target, you can go to DH Data Import and then you can select ODBC database and you would use that ODBC connector to connect to the um, data shed database. And so you could bring it in that way. Great, thank you Lee. The second question, uh, there's a comment that free Bing maps are no longer available in ArcGIS 10.2. The question is, are Bing maps free for target? Um, that's a good question. Um, Yes, Bing Maps are free within Target. Um, all you need is a Geosoft ID, um, which you can sign up for free in minutes and get a Geosoft ID. And when you sign up, when you sign in with your Geosoft ID, and you have a plan map like this, you can select the Bing Maps um, tool, and you can import a Bing Maps um, satellite image or aerial image straight into your plan map over here. So it is free. Thank you. The next question is, can you calculate percentiles in target for ArcGIS? Um, yes, you can. Um, so whenever you're symbolizing the data that you have, so for example, these geochemistry points that I had before, um, when you apply the color range to these symbols, um, you can do, you can have the distribution um, displayed to you as percentiles or actual PPMs. Um, so you can look at the, the different data ranges uh, in either way that you want to. Thank you. The next question, uh, it seems that the strip log you showed was a vertical hole, but can you display a strip log of an inclined hole? Um, with the strip logs, no, you can't. So that strip log is just the report for one drill hole, and uh, it's just to display all the data um, for that one drill hole, and it will always display them vertically. So no, it won't. You can't have it inclined strip logs. This is a question around um, confirming whether you can make voxel models and ISO surfaces in target for ArcGIS? Um, yes, you can. So the 3D capabilities which I showed you for creating a 3D voxel and a 3D lithology voxel, those capabilities are available in target for ArcGIS as well within the 3D viewer. So I think I showed you an example of the voxel in the 3D viewer inside Target for ArcGIS earlier. 
So this voxel here is actually created um, in Tiger for Arc. Great, thank you. Um, I saw there is an option on 3D Viewer to import DXF files. So the question is, can I import 3D DXF files or engineering 3D models? Yes, you definitely can, and that's a really handy tool. Um, so if you have existing um, geology models or any kind of DXF model that's 3D, you can quickly import them into the 3D viewer just by going add to 3D imports and then selecting AutoCAD DXF. Um, those DXF files can also be added to your section maps. So if you have a, if you have a 3D DXF model, you can import or then to your section and it will slice it along the section window as well. So lots of options for 3D DXF files. Thank you. There's um, a query here on they'd um, like to see the Windows Explorer folder structure that Target uses and how we would go about managing projects for multiple users including saving wireframes, strings, etc. Um, that's a good question. Um, so what we recommend when you're setting up your project directory, I'll show you an example of mine. It can get cluttered once you have a lot of data in here. But what I would do is I would create my Geosoft project file in the same location where all my data files that I'm going to be importing are. When I start to create maps and create databases and create grids within Target, all the outputs will automatically be saved to the project directory. And any time I go searching for a grid or searching for a database or search to import something, it'll take me straight to my project directory. So we recommend you house your project files and your GSOP project in the same directory to streamline your workflow. Also, the file paths, um, when you start creating maps and grids, they're all relative to the file um, to the project directory. So if you start to create maps within that directory, if you were to move that, um, that folder to a different location, everything under that will come with it. So you don't lose the file path or the location to those files if you do it that way. Thank you, Lee. Um, we've still got time for some more questions, so if you have any more, please um, yeah, continue to send them through. There's a few more that we're going to get through as well. Lee, can you update a section map with drill hole data that has been added? Um, yes, you can. So I'll show you an example of that. So if you have refreshed your project with more data from the, from the source, um, you can recreate your section maps based on the new database. So you can come into section, select your holes, right click and then recreate section. So this won't override any data that you have in here, but it will just re-import all the new drill hole information that you've brought into your project. In Target for ArcGIS, the workflow is a little bit different. Um, you can't simply recreate the section and update the section, you need to generate a new section, uh, so a brand new section, except what you can do is use the templates for the map plotting parameters to plot the exact same section again. And in Target for ArcGIS, what you can do is add um, map tag names when you generate a new section. And so, for example, you could use the same template to generate a new section with new data and you could tag the new section maps based on the date that they were created. So that way you can keep track of all your, um, the most up-to-date sections. Thank you. The next question is, does Target only apply to mineral deposits? Um, no, definitely not. So these subsurface um, tools can be applied to all types of subsurface data, drill hole or borehole. So for example, wells, if you have water wells, or if you have geotechnical wells, or even some kind of um, monitoring type of well, 
these tools can all be applied um, to those cases as well. The next question is in two parts. How do you run a voxel 3D model with relation to composites and can you intersect wireframe with samples and then calculate composites? So I'll just take the first question. Can you create a voxel with respect to composites? So when we composite a database, we are recalculating the from two intervals um, to get new composite intervals with those with the average value. So here's an example of a composite that I've done, so every 10 meters. So when we're creating our voxel model, um, 3D gridding, gridding, we can choose which database that we want to grid. So we, I could select the assay database and I can also select the composite database as well, if that's what you really want to do. And could you just repeat the second part of the question there, Crystal? The second part is, can you intersect wireframe with samples and then calculate composites? I think, uh, I think the um, second part of the question was supposed to be first. So with the wireframing, um, those wireframes can be exported to a DXF format. Um, I'll just change. So this wireframe that I have here, these can be exported to DXF and those DXFs can then be brought into my section maps. And so a closed body would appear much like this interpretation that I'm showing here, and you would have a polygon, which is where the wireframe model intersects with the section. Now, we don't actually have a direct tool that will allow you to look at where the wireframe intersects with your data values to create a new composite. We don't actually have that functionality yet. Um, these sections are actually dynamically linked to the database. So a workaround that you might be able to do is actually set up a dynamic link so that I can see the database and say a profile. Oh, um, and show a profile for that data. And what you could do is create a new channel in your database perhaps, um, click on the section hole trace where it intersects with the wireframe and you would see those values light up in your database and you could, you know, you could create a marker in the database for that and then you could perhaps um, have those intersections um, in your database and use that for plotting. Thank you. Does target for ArcGIS calculate the volume of voxels and ISO surfaces? Um, yes, it does. So in my 3D viewer, um, with the voxel, you can look at the statistics for all the visible cells in your model. Um, attributes, so you can view visible cell statistics for all the cells that are visible in the 3D viewer um, and you can get a volume estimate of that. So that volume estimate is actually based on your cell size of the cubes, your interpretation distance and how many cells that you have visible in the 3D viewer. Um, the ISO surfaces are a little bit different. Um, what you would do is you'd clip the voxel to, with, to just within that ISO surface and then you'd look at the visible cell statistics um, for that. But with the wireframing um, tools that I showed you before, um, the volume for those closed, volume, um, closed bodies uh, definitely reported to you. This next question is in relation to the previous one about intersecting wireframe with samples and then calculating composites, you described a workaround. A suggestion would be to uh, flag the samples. Do you think that um, that would work? Flag the samples. Um, not quite if, sure if I understand I th that. I but think um, 
I think they were saying, um, is that what you were suggesting? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So with the dynamic linking between the section map, which has the wireframes and the drill hole data traces, and my database, what I would be doing is moving my cursor over the drill hole traces where it intersects the wireframes and having a look at that in the in the database and flagging those intervals in my in my database so it's a, it's a workaround um, that might might help you out thank you Lee that's all the questions we have time for today however any unanswered questions will we will be responded to via email and distributed to all the attendees and registrants before we conclude our webinar I have another quick poll question to pose to everyone. Will these tools be helpful for upcoming projects? Yes, I will apply them in my current projects. Yes, please contact me. I would like to purchase or renew a license. No, these tools won't be helpful for my projects or not right now but maybe for future projects. Thank you very much for responding to that question and thank you for joining us today. We would love to hear how you are using Geosoft to advance your projects. Please send your stories to explore at geosoft.com and everyone enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you very much.